Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and it's such an honour to, to rise today to speak uh, about this very important bill. But before I begin, I, I would like to start today by commending all those who spent so many decades uh, drafting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and to the grassroots leadership and civil society groups that have brought us here today. Also, those that introduced bills in support of the implementation of UNDRIP, MP Denise Savoy, Savoy, Tina Keeper, and the motion tabled by MP Irene Matheson. Mr. Speaker, the NDP has a long history of support for the UN Declaration. For instance, in 2006, late Jack Layton wrote, in quotes, it is our belief in social justice and equity that leads us to support the Declaration. Mind you, stating that even before the UN General Assembly adopted it. And I would also like to give a special acknowledgement to my partner, Romeo Saganash, whose Bill C-262 forms the basis for Bill C-15 that we are debating today. And Mr. Speaker, it has been a very long road to get here. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted by the UN General Assembly in September 2007 to enshrine the human rights that, in quotes, constitute the minimum standards for survival, dignity and well-being of the Indigenous peoples of the world, and I would also respectfully suggest the security of the person. The declaration was a result of over two decades of negotiations between Indigenous peoples, civil society groups and nation states consisting of 24 preambular paragraphs and 46 articles that define the inherent minimum human rights of Indigenous peoples, and there was a recognition that the rights of Indigenous peoples were being violated throughout the world. The articles within the Declaration uh, affirmed the social, cultural, political, economic, environmental, and spiritual rights of Indigenous peoples. This includes the right to self-determination, the right to free prior and informed consent over matters impacting Indigenous rights, including resource extraction on Indigenous lands and territories. Should these rights be violated, Mr. Speaker, Article 27 of the Declaration also provides for fair and mutual acceptable procedures to resolve conflicts between Indigenous peoples and states, including procedures such as negotiations, mediation, arbitration, national courts, and international and regional mechanisms for denouncing and examining human rights violations. It is important to note that the requirement for free prior and informed consent in activities of any kind that impact on Indigenous people, their property, or territories differs in law from a veto and that courts are obliged to take into consideration the facts, circumstances, and the law applicable to given cases, while veto is an absolute concept in law. Canada, Mr. Speaker, was an active participant in the drafting of the Declaration over a period of two decades, along with numerous Indigenous organizations and representatives and other states. But despite that work, despite that hard work, Canada, under the Harper government, opted to oppose the adoption of the Declaration in 2007 with three other countries, Australia, the United States, and New Zealand. And although the current Prime Minister indicated in 2015 that, in quotes, the most important relationship was with Indigenous peoples, he, along with the Liberal caucus, continued not to support Bill C-262, introduced in April 2016. And it was only through public pressure that the Liberals finally caved and voted in favour of Romeo Saganash's bill. And this was in spite of the fact that during the 2015 election campaign, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister promised repeatedly to, in quotes, adopt and implement the UN Declaration. It is time we move away from the Indian Act, Mr. Speaker, and move forward in protecting the human rights of Indigenous peoples throughout Turtle Island. It is time that we confirm the application of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in Canadian law, obliging 
the government to ensure that all legislation is consistent with the rights articulated within the declaration, as well as to prepare and implement an action plan to achieve the declaration's objectives, including addressing injustices, combating systemic racism and discrimination, and eliminating violence against Indigenous peoples. But as we speak here today, Mr. Speaker, we are very far away from achieving that goal. As I rise, in fact, today in the House, Mr. Speaker, this current government is in breach of the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruling to immediately stop racially discriminating against First Nations children on reserve. Ten non-compliance orders to date, and they have now indicated that they will break the law and not pay what was ordered by the tribunal. There are more children in care now than at the height of residential school as a result of human rights violations, including failing to afford families with their right to housing and meeting international obligations to ensure access to clean drinking water in addition to numerous other human rights violations that make it almost impossible for families to survive, let alone thrive. This government turns a blind eye to human rights, even when it impacts our children and families. And so eloquently stated by amazing warrior Cindy Blackstock, in quotes, there is simply no credible defense to suggest that we, the people of this period, don't know any better. And as talk about reconciliation has become the new normal in this house, this government continues to fight St. Anne residential school survivors in court and 60 scoop adoptees, a crown behavior that continues to strip survivors of justice, a total disregard for the violence they endured and continue to endure in real time, dealing with the residual traumatic and lingering pain experiences that changed or shattered lives, Mr. Speaker, including my dear friend and spirit sister, Michelle Guerin. Michelle Guerin is a member of Musqueam Indian Band and an esteemed lawyer who testified during the National Inquiry truth gathering process as a survivor. Michelle was apprehended in the hospital at birth during the 60s scoop from her mother, Beverly Guerin, who served two years in the Canadian Navy and worked as a secretary at an engineering firm. Lives of persons who end up in systems are often left, their fates are left to the whims of those making decisions and leave them often very unstable, which was also true for Michelle, who in deciding to testify chose to pursue a freedom of information request to obtain her child welfare file. Records she used that as testimony walking through her journey as a kid in care, labeled as a high risk youth. And I would argue that the label was incorrectly provided. It shouldn't be given to institutions that are rather at risk of meeting the needs of children and families a failure of meeting the needs of Michelle as a young person, including objectifying her at the age of 14 in a local newspaper ad by the Child and Family Service Ministry in attempt to find her a home, stating in quotes, looking for a home for a pretty, independent teenage girl, absolutely no parenting required. Even as a young person, she was objectified and sexualized by the system, her rights totally disregarded, her personal experience that brought her to feel connected with the late Tina Fontaine, a young Indigenous girl left alone at 14 by the system, murdered, and whose valuable life was further disrespected with the acquittal of her accused murderer. As Michelle so clearly shared in the hearing in British Columbia during the National Inquiry, in quotes, the system labels us, neglects us, ignores us, fails us. The worst failure is that decade after decade, nothing changes. Our women, girls are still the prey. So we held the inquiry. There were lots of politics around the inquiry, yet the families persisted. They needed to be heard, 
and I testified as part of my healing journey. The inquiry lawyer told me it's rare to have a lawyer testify as a survivor. More importantly, I testified to be a voice for my sisters. Still, there is no action, and it feels as if our words fell on deaf ears and the government has chosen to do nothing. Deaf ears, Madam Speaker, failing to invest in the current housing crisis, which has become even more critical during the pandemic. And many Indigenous people continue to be unsheltered as a result of the violent and wrongful dispossession of our lands, territories and resources, a situation that has become even further pronounced on reserve, where issues of overcrowding, disrepair, inadequate infrastructure and lack of affordability is the norm, not the exception. And the continued failure of this government to heed the calls from the member for Nunavut, the member for, for, from Kiwetanuk Aski and the member from Timmins Jane Bay to take immediate action to address the massive shortages of homes and mold crisis that has resulted from major disrepair. And promises of ensuring an end to water boil advisories on reserve, Mr. S Madam Speaker, broken promise after broken promise. A vile human rights violation noted by Human Rights Watch in a 90 two-page report citing the Canadian government's failure to meet a range of international human rights obligations, including their failure and extensive excuses to end all water boil advisories on reserve in Ontario, Manitoba, and throughout the country. Even now, as we hear are here, Madam Speaker, in the midst of a pandemic, this government continues to find excuses not to afford Indigenous peoples with the, this basic human right to water, yet it had billions of taxpayer dollars to spend on TMX pipeline choices. And Madam Speaker, although Canada has endorsed the UN declaration, they still don't apply that right to free prior and informed consent, as has been witnessed in Ganesatage, Site C, TMX, Keystone XL, Muskrat Falls, Wesowatan Territory, Baffinland, Mary River Mine, 1492 land back, not limited to. An excessive police force or lack of, as witnessed in, Mi'kmaq, in the Mi'kmaq fishing dispute where police forces stood by their fishery, literally watching it burn to the ground. So it's no wonder that there has been criticism of Bill C-15 coming from Indigenous peoples who have lost faith that maybe this time, maybe this time the government will do the right thing. It is one thing to endorse the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and it's a completely another thing to respect and uphold the rights affirmed throughout the Articles of the Declaration. Indigenous peoples have no reason to trust the government. And I understand this trust, Madam Speaker. It is valid, warranted, and earned. I have the same mistrust, which is why we need this Bill C-15, so we can finally have some legislative affir affirmation of our minimum human rights contained in the Declaration. My support for the bill comes from my valid mistrust of the government to do the right thing. Just like my trust has grown thin watching the clock run down, taking away the hopes once again that this will actually make it through Parliament. Mr. Speaker, why does this current government continue to hold this bill up? Because, Madam Speaker, Indigenous people have seen and felt the impacts of human rights violations, including those contained in the Indian Act and other policies in Canada that maintain the violation of our rights to this day. Not only have governments failed in meeting the most basic human rights, but they have legislated a violation of those rights. It is abhorrent that in 2021, Indigenous human rights are still up for debate almost daily in this House and consecutive conservative and liberal governments can pull billions out of their hat for their corporate friends, but batter back and forth about how they can come up with the money needed to resolve the water boil advisories on reserves, respecting the right to housing, and actually put in place a national action plan to resolve the ongoing violence perpetrated against Indigenous women and girls caused by colonialism that continues to this day.
it is time that this government start upholding human rights to ensure that the dignity, safety, and security of all persons is realized. And this bill confirms these rights and ensures that any new legislation going forward will be consistent with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as the summary of the bill affirms. It is a critical step towards replacing the Indian Act with human rights. This government needs to act now, and I cannot express that strongly enough because the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is essential. Bill C-15 confirms the application in Canadian law, meaning that courts can refer to and have referred to the Declaration to interpret domestic law in addition to other distinct legal frameworks that also inform the interpretation of these Indigenous rights, including the Constitution, Indigenous law, our treaties, and international law that also respect and affirm those rights. None of these legal frameworks supersede the others. They are interrelated and mutually reinforcing. Now, Bill C-15 is not perfect and requires amendments. This has been noticed, noted in witness testimony by Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in our study of the bill in committee. We must ensure that a broad-based consultations occur as we move forward to strengthen the bill. For example, a recommendation to include in preambular paragraph 8 in Article 6.2 a reference to racism. Mr. Speaker, we know there are growing movements of white supremacy here and abroad. And we also know that a result of human rights violations, Indigenous peoples throughout what is now referred to as Canada have been left poor and, for, and far, far too often unsheltered on our very own lands. And all the while, violence resulting from systemic racism, racism, including what is being witnessed in the case of Aisha Hudson, or a, a failure of the justice system in the case of Colton Bushi. The fact that Indigenous women and girls 2S and diverse gendered persons continue to go murdered and missing without urgent action, like our lives or loss of lives, does not matter. And the onus... And the onus of proving systemic racism is placed on Indigenous people, whether sitting in the House of Commons, boardrooms, or fighting boots to ground. Indigenous people are constantly put in a place of having to justify experiences with systemic racism and the microaggressions we experience, having to explain this reality to those in privilege who get to decide whether those claims are valid or not. Gaslighting. We need to call this out. To do otherwise would merely uphold the white supremacy and paternalism that is designed to keep Indigenous people oppressed. Let's start with the game and, and the need to protect the status quo and just call it what it is, systemic racism. And not only when it's convenient, but let's just call it systemic racism, neocolonialism, white supremacy, human rights violations. We need to first acknowledge truth if we will ever realize a change in behavior. Call it out and let's get on the work of creating a world where all people are safe and uphold their basic human rights so we can achieve, all achieve our right to joy and dignity. Let's stop fighting Indigenous peoples in courts, whether it be about lands and resources or our right to free prior and informed consent, fighting children, 60 scoop adoptees, residential school warriors, and let's just honour human rights. Laws need to be put in place to protect Indigenous peoples from acts of racism. Mr. Speaker, the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples should have happened 13 years ago, when it was adopted by the UN General Assembly. How many years will we have to wait before Indigenous peoples' human rights are finally respected? The time for excuses, Madam Speaker, has run out, and that is why I I'm proud, along with my NDP colleagues, to call on this government to act now and finally uphold the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Thank you very much.